Slow, slow, slow. That's it. Slow down, mate. Slow down. Slow down. That's right, folks. It's that time again. You to the year 2022 is here. It's already scraping. I haven't even got to the hard bit yet. From the beach to the bush. And this year we're going harder than ever. We're tackling Coffs Harbour. Things are going to get dicey. Now we're very excited about this one because we have some new vehicles in the lineup. As you can see, the brand new Ranger is behind me. We also have an LDV vehicle, which we haven't done much testing with. You guys have asked for it, so we brought it along on the test. We're very excited about this one. A couple of the usual suspects like the Hilux, the BT50, the D-Max, um, a bunch of modern dual cab utes. So we're going to put these to the ultimate test. And as you can see, the blokes behind me, we've got a bunch of industry experts with a combined 100 years worth of experience that work on these utes every day to give you the real info you won't find anywhere else. So we're here to test these vehicles and how they perform in the real world. That's how you guys want to see them tested, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to test these things from the beach here in Coffs Harbour to the mountains behind us and some of the harder tracks to really test these things off-road so you can make a better decision before you fork out your hard earned on one of the vehicles. So buckle in because this is going to be one wild test. This is not just another auto journo car test where we read specs off their website, check armrest squishiness, discuss the clarity of the sound system and drive them carefully down a dirt road to our local Big Four caravan park. <laughs> nah, that's not our style. We push these utes to the absolute limit and for some we may have pushed a little too far. Along for the ride we've also got Zach who's kindly brought with him his new LDV T60. Let's see how it goes. Two of the usual suspects are missing from this year's lineup. Volkswagen will be releasing their new generation Amarok soon and didn't want their last generation tested alongside newer vehicles, which is fair enough. Though, once again Nissan has refused to get a suppressed vehicle. <laughs> they mustn't like how we test our utes. We'll let you be the judge as to why they won't let us have a vehicle for testing. Which is kind of a shame because I reckon the Navara would have done really well in this year's test. To level the playing field, each ute has been fitted with a set of Goodyear Wrangler Duratrack All Terrains, which will be perfect for scrambling our way through Coffs Harbour. We've set all tyre pressures to the same PSI to make it even across each terrain. Righto, we're not here to muck around, so it's time to hit the bush. Obviously, most of you watching this will likely modify a ute before tackling tracks like this. However, these couple of days testing is to focus on their performance straight from the showroom floor. First track is the Rover track. Coffs is big boy country and standard utes are already looking out of place. So let's see how they go. I don't think people realise how capable standard dual cab utes are. Just straight off the showroom floor, they are wildly capable little cars. You wouldn't dare to drive them up things that you're actually capable of doing. <laughs> it's great to see how many of these modern utes are coming with rear diff locks as standard, you know? It's a big upgrade to their capabilities here and helps them put that traction down, especially when they're on an upgraded tire. The LDV is the only vehicle in this test that doesn't come equipped with a factory rear locker. So it's been doing a little bit tougher on these tracks. Um, a rear locker would certainly make it easy. But unfortunately, it needs quite a few revs to get to the same places. Very well driven. The Ranger has one clear disadvantage off-road. We found that out only 50 metres into the track, the ramp over angle. While it sits a similar height off the ground to the other utes, its longer wheelbase on these tracks meant that it was bottoming out more than the others. Nothing a bigger lift and bigger tyres won't fix. Well, this is steep. Very steep. Oh, sh It's already scraping. I haven't even got to the hard bit yet. I just feel like it's running down on its belly the whole way down. You know, I doubt it might be the sexiest looking ute of all of them, but might be the least suited to this sort of terrain. Well, got ourselves in a little bit of a predicament with the D-Max here, which, so we're just going to grab some Max tracks and chuck them underneath this and then we should be able to get down nice and easy. Just like that, we are out of strife, and away we go. It's 
It's a little mountain goat. Nothing frightens a triton. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite car for off-roading in stock form. Without a doubt, this is it. Leave it stock, this is the one. It's nimble, it's capable, it's nice and light. The lack of a locker on the LDV was actually that much of a disadvantage, we decided not to take it down this section of four-wheel drive track. Coming back out of it is a steep off-camber climb that it would really need to push hard on to get out. Also, this is Zach's pride and joy, so there's no need to cause unnecessary damage, so we opted to take a beeline. I might just chuck those max tracks in here. This is sort of a bit off cambered, straight up this big steep hill here. Some of the vehicles might struggle a bit with clearance, and because it's off cambered, it's gonna put you straight into this wall here. So we're trying to protect some of the paddles, I suppose. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> well, we had to really spot that one up, use a couple of max tracks, that's uh, pretty wild. Just the clearance was the only thing that held me back then. Well played, well played mate. That was a good drive. Very good. Perfect drive, that rear locker, tell you what, worth its weight in gold. Some handy work on the throttle. The Triton's up next. I reckon the Triton will do quite well here because it's probably got a better ramp over angle, angle than the Ranger. It's got the factory rear locker. Fingers crossed, it does it all right. That's it, that's it. That's it, that's it. Slow it down, mate, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. It, it already made it when you decided to give it lots. <laughs> Well played, well played. Driven very nicely. Might have been one of the nicest drives of the last 38 seconds, that's brilliant. Yeah, this is Morbid Trail. You might have seen us over the years take our modified four-wheel drives on tracks like this around Coffs Harbour. It's not the typical place you'd take standard utes straight from the showroom floor, but we're out here to test utes and see their capabilities off-road. So that's exactly why I've come to Coffs Harbour and why I picked this track out. It's gonna be super challenging pick the right line up here. We're gonna give it a go. I can't promise anything because it's also quite wet as well. There's a lot of moisture around on these tracks and as soon as you get a bit of moisture on these tracks, it becomes absolutely insane to try and get traction. So I'm gonna send the Ranger up first, hopefully pick a line up through here. And if it makes it up there, I'll be very, very surprised. Absolutely amazing. I thought there was actually about a 20% chance it's going to drive up there in its own steam. So Notice just how much harder the LDV had to work to get up this B line compared to the control of the others up the main line. That's why we put so much value on that rear locker in this testing. You push a ute hard like that, and that's when you start breaking CVs and diffs. If you're thinking, well, a locker isn't that expensive, surely I'll just buy one aftermarket for my LDV vehicle. Well, you're going to be in a little bit of a world of hurt because you can't actually get an aftermarket locker for an LDV. That being said, for the price point of an LDV, this is still impressive and doing better than we initially thought. What happened here is Dave really wanted to test out the Triton and has opted for a harder line. Unfortunately things haven't worked out and the rear end has slid into a hole and ended up hard against the bank. 
After a few goes at it, we're not keen to damage the vehicle, so we've opted to get the BT up top to snatch it out. And just like that, it's out. Unfortunately, we've sustained a little bit of damage to the rear bumper and side steps on this one. Luckily, it's nothing too serious. Very good though, very good. I mean, this is a proper little track. I mean, we usually take modified vehicles here, not one straight out of the dealer showroom. And uh, goes to show with a set of tires, a couple of decent lines, a bit of rock packing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you get the job done. Now the last challenge, a big slippery hill. As long as they can find traction, it shouldn't be an issue. Keeps getting steeper and steeper as we go up. So I'm just gonna give it a bit of juice and maintain a bit of momentum here as we come up. I'm just gonna bump it up over the top here. No, that ramp over angle's just just got me, got me hooked. Up and over, no worries, up the T60. Don't you dare beep at me. I actually really like Oh, that's this. Wonderful. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, boys. We go, up we go. Traction starting to be a thing on this hill. Well, there we go. I think it's safe to say that these utes are surprisingly capable straight out of the box. A good set of tyres, and they've made light work of some really challenging tracks. The Triton and Hilux were winners off-road. Both had great clearance, really good control in low range, and felt the most capable off-road. So, they get top marks. The D-Max and BT50 get pass marks, and the Ranger drops a point for the lack of clearance. And the LDV sits at the bottom for the lack of locker and really bad approach angle. It's worth noting that the top spec LDV does have a locker, which will cost another four grand. Whether all other utes here have lockers in the mid-spec versions of their vehicle. Tough tracks probably aren't the forte of the LDV, and not being equipped with a factory locker certainly holds it back. But you've got to keep reminding yourself that this vehicle is half the price of some of the other utes on this test. How yeah, good's this? Just arrived on the beach. Nice to get a bit of sand under the tires of all these new utes. And the tide is out, so we're gonna have pretty easy going on the beach. But we'll probably get up in that soft sand, give it a real go. As you can see, these modern dual cabs have got so much torque and power these days. And with the automatic transmissions, I mean, it's a match made in heaven. Get your tires down to the right pressure, and they're so good on the beach. That said, there are some clear differences we noted while testing. From the driver's seat, this new Ranger certainly has the most power. It's the most fun to drive. It's got a lot of torque and it makes it low in the rev range. It makes it nice and easy to drive, especially on soft sand like this. There's power wherever you need it, so it handles this stuff with ease. Obviously, we're comparing some smaller four-cylinder, two-liter engines, but this V6 three-liter is an absolute impressive vehicle to drive on the sand, and it's fair to say it's doing it with absolute ease. This is actually my first drive of um, the new LDV T60, and it's it's okay. It's an entry-level um, dual cab ute, and, and I would say that it feels like an entry-level dual cab ute. It's certainly lacking a little bit of the refinement and the niceness that some of the other models have. I really have to push the accelerator a lot more to get it to, to kind of go. It's, it, it's, it's 
it's got enough power, but kind of only just in my mind. It... This is the new high output Hilux. It's had a number of changes made to the engine, which we'll talk more about later, but what it has in turn produced is a lot more responsive vehicle, more power, and all around a little bit of a quieter engine. As expected, the Ranger with its V6 and all that torque was a clear standout. The more low down power you have, the less you'll get bogged driving in soft sand. So the Ranger is a winner here. The D-Max, Hilux, BT50 all did a great job and had no issues. And while the LDV did keep up, that two litre by turbo engine was a little sluggish down low. Its power was higher in the rev range, so taking off and keeping momentum in the really soft sand was harder than all the other four wheel drives. The Triton was great in the sand, and has the key addition that the others don't have that makes it so perfect for beachgoers. It's one of the only vehicles that we are testing that does have a really significant transmission cooler, so it certainly puts a bit of ease of mind when you are driving on some soft sand and the transmission is really flicking through the gears. For beach driving, the Ranger gets top marks for its power. The Triton being so light and having the auto cooler scores well, and the LDV drops a few points for its lack of power down low. Time for us to test how bushproof these vehicles are. What do we mean by bushproof? Well, when you take these utes off-road to remote destinations, what are the parts that might let you down and stop you from getting home? Things like alternated position, CV and drive shaft design, and things that hang lower than the cross members that are likely to be knocked off-road will be examined closely. One thing we have noticed, and this is, it shares the same DNA obviously with the BT50, that this particular vehicle, you're not going to have many mechanical dramas with it. Now, in the in the event you do break a CV or something like that, they've actually made it a lot easier to change, and we can speak from experience on that. You're not likely to break many CVs. Even all the hard tracks we've done with our D-Max, we've only probably broken one CV in probably, I don't know, 30,000 hard kilometres. So it's quite strong from a drive train point of view. The other thing though, because they keep changing parts on every model that comes out every year, the parts are different from the old model. So with CVs in particular, there's no aftermarket support yet for CVs. So you're gonna be buying them from Isuzu and they're gonna cost you an absolute fortune. One of the other things we've noticed as well, it does come with an aluminum tail shaft. Now that's obviously to make it lighter, uh, maybe drive a little bit better. But if you are using these vehicles um, in the rough sort of terrains that we typically do, um, you might find you will dint that tail shaft. And like I said, there's no aftermarket support so genuine is very very expensive and you're up for big dollars that way one thing i'll say about this particular motor which could be i guess the same for just about all of these motors is make sure you're carrying spare serpentine belts we have had a couple go on the three liter which is an easy fix just get a new one put it back on but if you're not carrying one it can be quite a pain if you're stuck somewhere remote because at the end of the day that won't run your water pump you will not be able to drive the vehicle very much before it starts to overheat. The fan belt on the other hand only just runs the air con, so even if that does break, you'll still be right to move the vehicle around. It does have a forward facing intake, which I don't think is the best setup um, when you're doing remote stuff. So of course, if you are thinking of taking this thing full wheel drive in, and of course you are, if you're watching this show, you'll want to put a snorkel on pretty lickety split. Now you open the engine bay and the first thing you see, it doesn't actually have an engine fan. It's got a big thermo fan here keeping the vehicle cool. Now, I've never been a fan of thermo fans. I think I've seen too many of them let vehicles down out in the bush. And I guess the, the verdict really is still out on these, whether these are going to be a hindrance or a help out in the scrub. But just by looking at it, if, for instance, you have an electrical fault and the thermo fan doesn't go, well, it's going to overheat and you won't be able to go anywhere. One positive is this beautiful intake here that's nice and high, has a couple of dips in it as water tracks and, and looks like it gets a really good bit of airflow from here. But that also spins into a bit of a negative if you are looking to do some deeper water crossings in this. Talking water crossings as well, the alternator sits quite low down there on the front of the motor. And when you consider that it sits proud of the cross member and with a big gap between the cross member and the bottom of the radiator support, I'd imagine that'd be up for a bit of a splash. Now, I'm sure Ford's engineers have thought, thought about that, so it may not be a concern, but I know especially for four-wheel drives, it's one of the first things we look for under the bonnet, as they're exposed to dirt, water, and all sorts of stuff. And being an open housing, that sensitive electronics there can, can get hurt by any sort of muck getting in there. I always get nervous when I see plastic intercooler pipes, especially when they're running past the pulley, in this case, formed to a shape to get around the air conditioning pulley. Now that's all good if everything's all good, but you spit a, you spit a belt, that may cut the pipe. 
you have a little bit of movement in one of your hoses or your engine, it can wear through that pipe. And once you've worn through a plastic pipe, especially when it's formed in this way, it's very difficult to replace, which could leave you stuck. Now, when you compare this to the 4J engine under the bonnet of the Mazda and the D-Max, they've got really nice, simple, big rubber intercooler pipes there that not only would be easy to replace if you had an issue, but they're really simple for some sort of intercooler upgrade there with alloy pipes and maybe a bigger core up front. You've got an alternator which is nice and high, which is great if you're going to be doing a lot of mud and water and stuff that us four-wheel drivers do a lot of. It's got a single serpentine belt that runs everything. I'd definitely take a spare with that. Um, all your main serviceable items are very easy to get to, so it gives me the impression that I wouldn't be overwhelmed trying to work on an engine like this. And it's quite bush-proof as well. It's like Toyota have said, you know, we don't mind you taking this out in the bush like a four-wheel drive is supposed to be used, which is always good to know. Um, the airbox um, breathes from inside the guard, which is, which is good. It's not going to be sucking water straight from a front-mounted intake. Um, you also notice that it's got the diff breathers are raised up in the engine bay as well. Just little things like that just give you a little bit more confidence to take this thing out in the scrub. The alternator is also quite low on this LDV, similar to the Ranger, where it could be in harm's way for a splash, and it's actually probably a little bit higher than the Ranger's one. But otherwise, quite a neatly put together engine bay and neatly finished. So, the Hilux gets top marks for being bushproof. The Triton gets a pass. The BT50 and D-Max lose a point. And the Ranger and LDV fall behind in this category. Probably wondering how we keep our lunch, food, drinks, cold when we're on the road. Now these utes, of course, have got no fancy 12 volt setups. I mean, but we've got a bunch of blokes out in the scrub for a few days. We need a few cold drinks. Now we've got the My Coolant plug straight into one of these Red Arc Go blocks. So what this essentially does is a self-contained 100 amp hours of lithium. So it's good to know that even with these stock vehicles, we don't have to do any modifications. We can literally plug and play a Go block in so we can run a fridge. Pretty good. There you go, folks. Hope you're enjoying Ute of the Year. Just wanted to let you know that Four Wheel Drive Fest is on right now, and it's our biggest sale of the year. I'll give you some examples. Pick yourself up a Snatch Recovery Kit, save 120 bucks. Bundle that up with a brand new set of Max Tracks, save yourself 150 bucks. There's 25% off Castrol. I think you get the idea. This ain't gonna last, and there's only one spot you can get it. FourWheelDrive247.com. When it comes to the new Ranger, everybody's excited about the new power plant. That's the V6 3 litre single turbocharged engine that you see in this XLT right here. The V6 delivers 600 Newton metres of torque and 184 kilowatts, making it a huge standout when you compare it to the rest of these utes. I've never been a big fan of the 2 litre by turbo, but I've been super excited to get my hands and drive one of these V6 3 litre turbocharged engines. You can't replace displacement, and this motor has certainly delivered it. New packages generally make me a little bit nervous. You just don't know what you're going to get, whether it's going to be a good performer over a long period. But with this car, it actually shares a lot of its homage from the F-150. So the three litre motor is actually a derivative from that vehicle. We can actually have some reassurance that this engine package is a proven package and that they've redesigned things to suit this application. The Toyota Hilux has a 2.8 litre four cylinder turbocharged diesel engine in it. And it's been around since 2016. Late 2020, Toyota released a high output motor. I want to talk about some of those changes because they're quite significant and certainly improved the performance of the previous model. One big change was it went to a ball bearing turbocharger. They also revised the head gasket, changed the pistons in the motor, and a couple of these changes have made a monumental difference to the performance of this engine. What it's also been able to do via that turbocharger is increase the boost pressure which on some of the earlier models did have some issues with the earlier turbocharger. So all in all, this has been a well-developed engine over the last five and six years to be now a really stable platform for the Hilux. When it comes to the engine behind this LDV, it's the two litre bi-turbo, producing 160 kilowatts of power and 500 newton meters of torque. Now, my concerns around this, look, it is a two litre engine. It is gonna be highly stressed with that bi-turbo engine to produce that sort of output. Use the example with the Ford Ranger bi-turbo. That car was really highly strung to achieve those outputs and power. I'm probably questioning and saying this is pretty much gonna be a similar vehicle. To achieve those numbers and the scope for actually custom tuning, getting some more improvements, I just don't think it's gonna be there for this two litre as well. So beside me is the Mitsubishi Triton 2.4 litre engine. 
This is a single turbocharged four cylinder and it's a great platform that Mitsubishi have been running for six years in both the MQ and MR Triton. Overall, this Mitsubishi Triton engine is really reliable. Over the years, we have seen a couple of issues with the vehicle. One in particular is the intercooler pipe gets a little crack under the front here. And what that causes is boost leak. The car runs a lot richer and tends to fill up the diesel particulate filter. A really easy fix and not a major concern. On paper, the Triton's probably got the lowest in the way of performance and sometimes it'd be a bit doughy and especially when you've got a big caravan on the back, you can feel like you're throwing an anchor out the back. It's really easy fixed and unlocking some extra power and torque with a custom Dynatune sees about 25% gain in power and torque. These two cars beside me, the Isuzu D-Max and Mazda BT50, both have the three litre four cylinder single turbo four JJ engine. It's been around since the mid 2000s in the Isuzu vehicle. It's now come to the time where they've revised and made the 4JJ3. And I can tell you there's been a number of changes to that engine, including a revision to the block, the fuel system. It's now got a revised crankshaft, lightweight alloy pistons, and also got a forward facing intake manifold and a revised turbocharger with a larger wheel on the back. And what does this mean? Better drivability and better response for you as the owner of the vehicle. So the new Ranger's V6 hasn't disappointed, but time will tell if it's going to have the reliability of some of the other engines on the market. The BT50 and D-Max with a revised 4JJ3 has been a workhorse and proved itself bulletproof earning its solid points in this category. The Hilux engine has seen revisions to fix a few of the earlier models problems and now is more reliable than ever. The LDV's engine combined with the twin turbo has us concerned for the longevity of the engine. Time will tell if it's able to go the distance over the coming years. Got no real major concerns about the transmission overheating because it does have that extra large transmission cooler on the Tritons. On the LDV, um, gearing low range, not as low as the other, so that's low first. It's uh, probably uh, quite a bit taller than particularly the um, the BTs and the uh, Isuzu. Uh, had a really nice short um, low range transfer case in that, and obviously the uh, the Ranger with the 10 speed box, nice short low range gearing for this sort of country. So Ford spent a lot of time in redeveloping that 10 speed automatic, changing the gear ratios, changing the shift patterns in this gearbox. They've actually done a really good job of taking customer feedback and actually applying that to their vehicle. From a driving point of view, it doesn't hunt and change gears every three seconds. I think because it's quite a torquey engine, it's able to hold gears a lot longer, so it doesn't feel like you're shifting gears every two seconds and the vehicle can't make up its mind. So that gives you a much nicer driving experience. The first thing I noticed is this vehicle's stacked with an eight-speed ZF transmission. These have been in circulation for a long time in a number of vehicles, and it's a great gearbox. Really, really nice shifting through the gears, and certainly impressive from a transmission in one of these cars. Not only does it have a reliable 2.4 litre engine, it's also backed with a six speed transmission with a front oil cooler. And for those people that are towing big vans behind the Triton, that oil cooler is a great asset to have on the vehicle in standard form when keeping those transmission temps down low. So the big change that happened in these new model vehicles was it went from a five speed transmission to a six speed transmission, which in theory is great. But what the feedback we did get from a lot of owners was when they were towing, the transmission started to hunt between fourth, fifth and sixth gear. What does that mean? It means more fuel going in the vehicle and more cost at the Bowser. The way to fix that is to get a custom dyno tune on the vehicle where we see about 25% gain in torque and that really stops the gearbox from hunting through the gears. It also gives you a good saving at the Bowser and such a nicer vehicle to drive. We've got a great bunch of transmissions in this class of ute. The 10-speed auto in the Ranger feels so much better with a bigger engine. The Hilux BT50, D-Max and LDV all get pass marks. But the one that gains a point is a Triton thanks to the cooling system. Well done Mitsubishi on that addition. All these utes being stock standard from factory found cough tracks to be particularly challenging. The lack of clearance out of the box causing many hang-ups and a lot of scraping of the underbody when thrown into the tough stuff. All models had the same setup, IFS front and leaf sprung rear. But there are a few key differences and some have done a better job than others. So with the suspension packages on these Tritons, 
They are a little bit limited in what they can do articulation wise and lift height wise. Just with the design of them, they have a very short stroke. The, the upper and lower control arms are very narrow and close together, and it doesn't really give us a lot of scope to be able to do a lot in the, even in the aftermarket space to get us those bigger lifts and that bigger articulation. Another issue you can get with a Triton when you lift them is driveline vibration because as you lift it, the driveline angle is changed. It's an easy fix with a center bearing offset bracket. However, it's another wad of cash you need to fork out when lifting these four wheel drives that you might not have to with others. The Hilux suspension setup is very good and you can get good lifts for them. However, something to note is the camber adjusters can seize on the lower control arms and the only real fix is to replace the entire lower control arm. It won't be an issue when buying new, however if you're buying used, it's worth inspecting this. As far as suspension goes with the Ranger, it shares a lot of similarities to the previous model. It's got a really wide gap between the upper and lower control arms, which means we're going to get some really good articulation out of this vehicle. Going to be able to lift it really well. It's got a nice big wide open wheel arch, which is just begging for a bigger tyre. One issue with the old setup was, when you put a 2 inch lift or bigger, the CV angle becomes much worse and you're at a higher risk of breaking CVs. This is the same across all utes but was particularly bad in the old Ranger. It'll be interesting to see if the new Ranger is the same. If yes, a diff drop kit will be necessary to get those CV angles back in line. With both of these vehicles, you're going to have some really good aftermarket support in the suspension space. They're Still a little bit limited, uh, they're better than the Triton would be, but they're not quite as good as the Ranger or the Hilux are going to be. The upper and lower control arms are a little bit further apart in this than they are in the Triton, but not quite as good as they are in the Hilux or in the Ranger. They'll give you a bit better articulation, but still plenty of suspension options for these, plenty of upgrades, and you can do a full two inch lift, no problem at all. There are aftermarket suspension upgrades for the LDV, however the front suspension has similar issues to the Triton, where the control arms limit articulation, so you might struggle to get a full 2 inch lift without more modifications. The Ranger and Hilux are the winners here because they allow for the most suspension lift and articulation. The BT50 and D-Max get a pass mark, and the Triton and LDV drop a point. This is the, the front brake system on the new Ranger. What Ford have done is they've gone to a 340 millimetre diameter rotor, up from 300 mil, so it's a significant uh, size increase. They've gone to a much bigger caliper and a much bigger pad. So the, the extra diameter there is essentially like giving us more leverage. So that leverage applies more torque to your wheel. So in reality, what it's like is having your, your wheel brace. If you can't undo your nut, what you do is you put a bit of pipe on the end and there's a whole lot less effort now to undo that nut. So Ford have done exactly the same thing. So previously 300 mil, that was our lever. Now we're at 340 mil. We've probably added, you know, another 50% uh, of actual uh, leverage there. Next is the pad. Why is a bigger pad more important? Well, essentially more pad gives you more friction. So braking is about turning your um, kinetic energy, your movement into heat by friction, so more friction, more braking. If we look at the rotor from this angle, we can see that the brake disc rotor is, is much thicker and much wider, and there's a lot more material in that. So we talked about converting that kinetic energy um, into heat, we've got to get rid of that heat. So a lot of metal just helps get that heat out of the system really well. Um, so again, not only do you have good friction and good braking, but you, you'll have good performance because you get that heat out and less fade. As you can see, uh, disc brake rear setup. Um, it again, quite a good, healthy size disc rotor. Uh, nice big uh, uh, two-piston caliper there. Um, but again, why is it important? What's what's the difference between a drum and a disc brake? So, there's a couple of major differences. Disc brake systems help get the heat out a whole lot better, so you can get lots of applications and get lots of heat. So much better braking. Uh, the other thing is, is a, a drum brake, if it gets wet uh, or gets mud in it, uh, it doesn't work particularly well and they, they struggle to get the heat out of those systems. So again, a better setup. Often you'll hear people say, well, you know, if 70% of your braking is at the front, why do we care about the back? Not quite the case with the dual cab ute because you're putting a thousand kilos in here, about 50% of your braking is coming from the rear when you've got it loaded. So rear brakes are really important as well as front. 
LDV have, have come to the party, so rear disc brakes. So it is the only other vehicle other than the Ranger with four wheel disc brakes. So uh, you know, Holden put these on uh, HQ Holdens and uh, we're now just finally getting there with Utes. So uh, good to see uh, LDV leading the pack with a uh, good price point car with, with good brakes. Toyota Hilux, uh, drum brake rear, disc brake front. Um, when it was launched, it was probably one of the class leading, you know, if you can call that, uh, of the era. So uh, Hilux had a much larger um, front rotor and uh, caliper setup than, than pretty much everything else in the market at the time. Um, unfortunately, now the rest of the market's starting to catch up. The new Ranger is lean with the back and rear discs and those massive front rotors. The LDV gets a big tick for rear disc brakes, but still has fairly small front rotors. A lot of you guys would know that Bendix make a huge range of brake components for just about every single four-wheel drive out there. But what you might not know is I've been able to twist Ian's arm to give away one performance brake upgrade kit from Bendix. So listen up, this is competition time. How do you win it? It's pretty simple. Simply let us know in the comments below what vehicle you drive and what you, you think should win our U to the year and more importantly, why? Let us know in the comments below. We'll be picking one lucky winner and you'll get a performance brake upgrade kit for your four-wheel drive. So we're here with the Mitsubishi Triton and from the outset I love this little car in a stock format. I think bang for buck it's a great little vehicle and very very capable but as a tourer and setting it up it does have some disadvantages. Let me show you why. So probably the main disadvantage with the Mitsubishi Triton is the measurement between the rear window and the axle line here. It measures out to be about 320 mil. That's much shorter than most of the other vehicles on this test means you're going to have more rear overhang and when you add the weight of a train canopy or a big touring setup it's going to make the car handle poorly. This means the Triton simply can't handle as much weight as some of the other vehicles on this test. So if you're thinking about building one of these vehicles into the ultimate touring package and fitting a train canopy here's what you need to know. So when it comes to canopies we typically advise our customers to go a three quarter length it still gives you stacks of room inside, but it also allows you to have your rear wall accessories, your spare tire, your jerry can, and your ladder. So this car being so new, it has a very, very advanced safety system. Some of this technology is gonna be quite difficult to integrate into trays and canopies. Let me show you why. So most of the dual cabs on this test have a full suite of sensors on the rear. They've got the camera mounted up in the tub, the parking sensors back here, but what's unique about the Ranger is it has a radar system integrated into the tail light. So this means to fit a tray, you're gonna to have to disassemble this tail light to get the sensor out. This means it's a much more sophisticated install to fitting these sensors to the back of your tray package. So if you are looking to put a tray and canopy package on the back of your Ford Ranger, make sure you go with a reputable manufacturer that has the technology and know-how to install all of these sensors to full factory functionality. So at Mitsalo, we have a full R&D division that as soon as we get a hold of the new vehicle, we strip it down, scan it, and make sure that we understand everything to do with all the technology. Now, while you might find a fair few of these on the road, you're not gonna find much aftermarket support for an LDV vehicle. Uh, the fact of the matter is, these things don't really get modified, and the big companies are not making bar work, they're not making accessories really to suit this. Now, you can get bits and pieces, but your choices are very limited. So like I said, if you are making a choice between this and one of the other vehicles, really think about what you're gonna use the vehicle for. And if you really wanna take this and make it an ultimate touring vehicle, it's probably not the vehicle for you. The Ranger and Hilux get top marks because they can handle a full-size canopy and tray. The Triton drops a point for its overhang behind the rear axle. While the LDV has some aftermarket support, it's very limited, which means it might not be the right four-wheel drive to build into a touring vehicle. While we didn't have a caravan on this trip, we know a lot of you will be towing with your ute, and the ability to tow is a huge consideration for you. When it comes to pulling power, there's no replacement for displacement, and the new Ranger with its 3 litre V6 easily takes the points here. Similar to the V6 Amarok in previous tests, it has the power and torque that'll match a standard 300 series when it comes to towing. One thing you'll find about all the new modern dual cab utes is they have huge tow ratings, but can they actually tow three tons or three and a half tons? The answer is usually no. They're too light and underpowered usually to tow a heavy load. The Ranger on the other hand, I think is being built for towing. There's a few things that um, give you that impression that Ford really wanted you to tow something heavy with this vehicle. Number one, it comes with a massive power plant. The V6 
delivers a stack of torque and it gives you the feeling that this thing would tow just about anything. But once you jump inside the vehicle, it actually has towing settings which change the mapping of the transmission and engine to suit towing better. Not to mention the towing brakes that come standard from factory with this vehicle just shows that Ford has recognised the importance of towing in the four-wheel drive ute category. The LDV's engine was missing the low down torque that you really need when towing. It'll be fine to tow your jet ski to the local boat ramp, but throw in a decent sized caravan and it'll struggle compared to the rest of the utes. The Triton, whilst a proven platform and excelling in other areas, does lack a bit of displacement with a 2.4 litre engine and it really shows. It is very sluggish off the line. You chuck a bit of weight behind it and it's really going to struggle. The Ranger again gets top marks here. BT50, D-Max, Hilux get to pass, and the LDV and Triton drops a point. So we're in the Ford Ranger, and it's got this. When you go to four low, when you turn the steering wheel, it tells you where your tyres are going to end up. This is cheating. <laughs> it's, it's my kind of Ford drive. It's actually perfect. <laughs> That front camera is awesome. You like it? I don't. Oh yeah. See, I'm, I'm in a mixed opinion with that. So there's a top down showing me around the car. There's one from the front bumper. There's one on either side there too, looking at the rear wheels. So it's going to be really useful for spotting as we go down these trails. So we're in the D Max here, and it has a full suite of sensors wrapped around it, and so does the Ranger. And, and most of the vehicles here, including the LDV, have all these parking sensors and cameras forward facing. They're pretty well equipped for tech. A lot of this stuff now is becoming compulsory to have to have a five star ANCAP safety rating. I tell you what, this thing absolutely loves to beep at you. The amount of times it's beeped at me about nothing. There we go, there's one. Apparently the parking sensor's going off when we're not even moving. I'm in the Ford Ranger and uh, some of the tech these, this new V6 Ranger's got is really, really cool. Check out what the screen shows you. It gives you full information on everything about the car. Elevation you're on, how much the car's tilting, you know, your tire pressures within the vehicle as well. They're pretty cool stuff. In terms of instrumentation and gadgets, the LDV is actually quite good. It's got a nice, clear and easy to use screen here. The climate control gadgets below it are really easy to see at a glance. So the BT50 is okay, but certainly not the best. The Ranger set's a hard example to beat. Finding the highlights feeling that little bit older, just the, the head unit style with the buttons and um, the screen between the gauges, you know, it's just not quite up there with some of these more digital dashes. Felt the Triton was just that little bit out of date was in terms of the digital experience. Where I do take issue with both the D-Max and the BT-50 is that the safety systems on these have gone overboard and they're just not sophisticated enough yet to be a good user experience. I found off-road constantly getting these brake warnings and big red lights in my face when we we're going through a rut or coming up to a corner where I was well aware of what was in front of me. All the tech in the new Ford Ranger is great, but the fact that you have to take it back to Ford each time you modify it for recalibration is a little bit much. That lift and tyres you added on just cost more because of the trip to the dealership. So, with the Ranger and the new versions of these utes that come out with this tech, it can be an advantage to all the mods at once from new. Get your canopy, your lift, your tyres, bar work done, and calibrate the sensors once to save money and the stuff around of doing it every time. The safety system in the D-Max and the BT-50 are great, but as four-wheel drivers who go off-road and for everyday driving, the fact that a lot of these features need to be turned off every time you get in the vehicle, it does get tiring. The Hilux and Ranger, on the other hand, is a lot better in this case because you can turn certain features off, which is very handy. Overall, the Ranger takes the points for this one, being the first of the next-gen utes, with the rest of the field scoring pretty evenly. Wow, what an amazing Ute of the Year test. I think you'll agree, this has been one of the toughest Ute of the Years we've ever had to do. Not just in terms of picking a winner out of all of these very capable vehicles, but literally the toughest in terms of the tracks that we've taken on. I mean, we've come to Coffs Harbour with one thing in mind, to test these vehicles in some of the toughest conditions known to man and four-wheel driver. And I think you'll agree, we have succeeded. Now the tough job, picking a winner out of all of these Utes. I mean, it's gonna be super tough. We don't have one in mind just yet. Now plan is, to take these vehicles on a series of dirt roads and find the closest local pub and from there we might have a few schooners and decide what can be the winner of the 2022 four wheel drive 24 7 U to the year 
Here's how the Utes ranked after all the testing was complete. But these are not the final results. We're missing the most important category, value for money. Of course money and budgets do come into it, and we need to factor in the pricing and find the best value for money ute in this lot. Remember, just because it's the cheapest doesn't mean it's great value, and just because it's the most expensive doesn't mean it's bad value. Let's take a look at the prices of the vehicles tested, and the price of their mid-spec versions. The numbers for the vehicles tested have probably shocked you, and that's because we've got the top spec Mazda, D-Max, Triton and Hilux. This is not a fair indicator of value because the top spec versions mostly give you cosmetic upgrades like fancier wheels, leather trim, sports bars and tray covers. To truly judge these vehicles on value for money, we've chosen the mid-spec version of each ute in white automatic dual cab. You can see the Hilux, D-Max, BT50 all sit in the middle of the pack in terms of pricing. The Triton comes in under $50,000 and the big story here is the Ford Ranger. You can only get the V6 in a $70,000 version of the Ranger. Firstly, when I heard about the price of the XLT, I was absolutely shocked. I thought that is a very expensive price to pay for a dual cab ute. But when you look at the price tag of all the utes on this test, you'll soon find that it really isn't in a league of its own when it comes to price. They're all expensive utes, especially when you're looking at that top echelon of the higher spec models. The range and pricing of these utes have changed considerably over the last few years. And given there's a 22,000 difference between a mid-spec Triton and a V6 Ranger, it's hard to compare them both. The Ford Ranger was the best ute we drove, but best value for money? If your budget is over 60,000, well, the Ranger would probably be your best bet. However, for many of you watching this thinking that, geez, $60,000, $70,000 on a ute is a lot to spend, which it is, here's what we reckon the top three best value for money utes are. Now let's start with the Mitsubishi Triton. At $45,000 for a base model, that really is great value for money. However, it probably would not suit the four-wheel driver who wants to modify the heck out of that vehicle and maybe put a big canopy and take it on a lap of Australia. It's simply not built for that. If you're looking to keep it as a relatively stock ute, well the Mitsubishi Triton might tick all your boxes and you're gonna save a stack of money, which you can put into maybe a bit more diesel to get out there and in the bush a bit more. Now, when it comes down to the Isuzu D-Max, the Isuzu used to always win the stakes when it came to value for money against the Hilux, but in this day and age, not so much. That's why I'd probably put the Hilux in front of the Isuzu. All right, the moment you guys have been waiting for, the results of our 2022 four-wheel drive 24-7 Ute of the Year test. Now, there can only be one winner in true four-wheel drive 24-7 style, and that winner is a unanimous decision from all of our experts, and myself included, the 2022 new generation Ford Ranger. Now, it wins for many reasons. It is a fantastic off-road machine. It comes with a powerful V6 matched to a beautiful 10-speed auto that seemed to tick all the boxes and won the hearts of all of our experts, myself and included. Now, would I actually go out and spend my money on a new generation Ford Ranger? Well, the answer is no. Now, I'll tell you why. There's two main reasons. Number one, it costs a lot of money to get one of those V6 Rangers. Now, at over $70,000, you've got to fork out a heck of a lot of coin before you get yourself one, which doesn't represent great value for money, in my opinion. Now, it is a lot of four-wheel drive for that money, but not everyone has $70,000 to go and blow on a new four-wheel drive. The second thing that sort of worries me, and it's something we can't really test for in our Ute of the Year, although we did four days of gruelling testing through the hills of Coffs Harbour, down on the beach, and put a couple of thousand Ks on the clock, we still can't test longevity. It's really hard to determine whether this new Ford Ranger is going to be a reliable beast off-road. So, they're the two reasons why I probably wouldn't put my money where my mouth is. Now, if I had to, it'd be a toss-up between the better value for money vehicles in our test. Now, according to all the experts, myself included as well, it was unanimous that the Mitsubishi Triton, the Toyota Hilux, and the D-Max were all jostling for second, third, and fourth position. Now, here's how it goes. In second, third position, it's really hard to toss up between the Toyota Hilux BT50 and the Isuzu D-Max. Now, usually the D-Max would win because it's a lot cheaper than the Hilux and you get a lot of vehicle for your money. It's a reliable diesel and we've had no dramas with D-Maxes over the years. They largely haven't changed. But this day and age, the price difference really isn't that much. Therefore, the Hilux comes out number two in our test. Number three in our test, of course, is the Isuzu D-Max and BT50. It's for all of those reasons that I've just mentioned. And number four is the Mitsubishi Triton. Now, at $45,000 for a base model vehicle, it really is the best value for money vehicle in our 
test full stop. However, if you're looking to modify one of those, maybe put a big canopy on it, load it at the hilt with accessories, well, you're gonna be bitterly disappointed because it really isn't built for that sort of stuff. But if you wanted to keep it stock, it's a really capable and like I said, great value for money vehicle that you'll absolutely love. Now, that is our opinions of our Ute of the Year test, but I'm very keen to see what you guys think. So leave us a comment below. Did you like our test? What vehicle would you choose if you had to put your hard earned dollars down on it? Very keen to find out and I'll be going through those comments. Anyway, that's a wrap from us. We'll see you next time on 4 Drive 24-7.